Cameron here, and I want to talk about something a little bit different today, and that is the Greek phalanx versus the Roman and manipular system to illustrate the differences between blocked practice and random practice. All right, so as a starting point, we first have to explain how the Greek phalanx works as well as the Roman manipular system before I can explain how that ties into blocked practice versus random practice. Now, the Greek phalanx, at least at the time in which they would uh, fight the Romans, essentially operated with these very, very long spears, and I do mean very long, at 16 to about 22 feet long, called sorissa. So they would get into a massive line like this, each individual about uh, occupying about a three foot square area of space. Um, first five lines would essentially lower their sorissas at the enemy. Uh, they'd march in a tight formation and essentially mow down their opponents. So it was extremely difficult for opponents to be able to get through uh, the line of sorissas, this just wall of spears, and as a result, they tended to drive back and uh, uh, pretty much mow down most of the armies they encountered. Well, overall, was it pretty effective? Well, there was this guy by the name of Alexander the Great, conquered pretty much all the territory that they thought existed uh, east of Greece in the span of, you know, a little over 10 years. So, yeah, I'd say so. That, that probably means it's pretty darn effective. Um, and up until the Greeks ran up against the Romans. Um, they essentially were undefeatable with this phalanx type structure. Now, there's a couple weaknesses to the phalanx, one of which should be pretty obvious. One, and the first one is the flanks. With all of these individuals holding these sarissas, these very, very long uh, spears, uh, all out in one direction, if someone comes up to the side of that phalanx, they're not going to be in a great position to be able to defend themselves. Uh, now, Greek uh, phalangitites did have, you know, their, their little small buckler there. Couldn't be big because, again, that's big two-handed sarissa that they're holding um, and a short uh, sword to be able to defend themselves last resort. But when you've got a little shield and a little short sword and you get hit in that particular situation, odds are you're not coming out on top. Okay. The other weakness, is, which is a little less obvious but makes sense if you sort of play it out in your head, is the phalanx is not great. On rough terrain. Going uphill, going downhill, it's very easy for the individuals to essentially uh, separate out. You no longer have an even line, um, as well as for individuals to get separated from each other in terms of these ranks going back uh, here. So essentially, if you've got too much space between the front guy and the second guy, well, the second guy is no longer able to help um, with his sarissa to be able to help protect him in case anybody gets past the frontline guy's uh, spear. So that can create problems. All right, so that's generally how the phalanx operate. Then you've got the Roman manipulative system. Now, Rome originally started with the phalanx, but ultimately they found they could not make it work in rough terrain, and Italy is nothing uh, if uneven terrain. I don't know if anyone watching this has ever visited. It's rolly, uneven terrain almost everywhere. There's a few exceptions <coughs> you can throw in, but essentially it's uneven everywhere. So when they were fighting their good buddies, the Samnites, for gosh, all of the how many times, uh, they ultimately scrapped the phalanx and went to this uh, new system, which we now call the manipular system, um, and uh, essentially formed themselves into what is known as the aculus triplex, which is a fancy Latin term that you can impress your friends with, which basically means three lines. Okay. Essentially, what they would do is have these sort of individual blocks, which for the sake of discussion, I'm just going to call each one of them cohorts, even though that's not technically true. Um, names change over time, uh, and form them into three lines. This would be the Hestati, which would be the younger individuals. Um, all of these individuals would be equipped with a scotum, which is a very, very large shield, and then a uh, gladius, which is a two and a half foot short sword. Um, then there'd be the princeps, who are, uh, had a little bit more experience playing as the Hestati, and they'd form the second line, uh, also similarly equipped with the scotum and the gladius, and then you'd have the triari, which were similarly equipped with the uh, scotum, but instead of a gladius would instead carry a spear, and these guys were the veterans of these first two ranks. Okay? All right. Now, the benefit, the total upside of this system is that each individual co cohort can operate independently. The downside is that each individual cohort has to operate independently. Okay? Commander standing way back here, back on a horse or whatnot, he cannot reliably tell these guys what to do or how to react, okay? 
it's too loud and there's no way that they're looking backwards to some sort of flag signal because they're right in the midst of it. So each one of these individual cohorts have to figure out what to do on their own. Okay? The way a line of battle would typically work against most enemies is the Hasataki would go fight first. If they couldn't uh, mow down the enemy, then they'd essentially fall back between the gaps that the princeps have that way. This is why they have these gaps, is so you can actually retreat in good order. Princeps would come up, they'd smash into them. If the princeps couldn't uh, beat them up, then it was left to the triari, which actually is a, a pretty common phrase for the Romans, uh, going to the triari, essentially mean trying everything you possibly could. All right. So that's essentially how it would work. But another element that, that sort of went into it for particularly the front two lines is that unlike with the phalanx, they could not, each individual soldier could not rely on the other soldiers around them to save their butt. Essentially, you've got to figure it out on your own, each individual soldier against the opponent you're going up against. All right. Now, in the actual combat, what that would mean is you've got to put it put up that big shield and be able to block all kinds of attacks, get in close, because the Gladius is not a long-range weapon, it's not even much of a slashing weapon, it's a thrusting weapon, okay? It's really, really good for getting through armor when you get up close, going through chain mail or breastplate or all that other fun stuff, but you got to get up there, you got to get in close. So, for individual Roman soldiers, they would have to train and practice as well as, you know, get out in the battlefield and experience what it's like to go up against a variety of different opponents, use that large shield to be able to counter their opponent's attacks, be able to get in close, and then start with the thrusting, um, which typically if they got you with one of those because of the state of medicine uh, and the fact you're in the midst of a uh, uh, battle at that time, uh, you probably weren't going to make it, okay? It was a really fatal weapon. Uh, but it did require that you get up in close. So all of these individual soldiers essentially have to figure it out on their own, as well as all of these individual cohorts. All right, so Romans go up against Alexander of Pyrrhus for the first time, Battle of Heraclea. Romans got their butts beat, okay? They could not at the time for individual soldiers figure out a good way to get around that wall of spears. So they ended up getting pushed back. Um, they were able to find some gaps here and there, but overall, it wasn't great. Then you get a sort of similar story at the Battle of Ascalon. All right. Then you get to Beneventum. At this point, each individual cohort has now figured out, okay, we need to be able to hit them here, or if there's some sort of unevenness here, then we've got to send in troops to be able to hit them uh, wherever we can find gaps, as well as individual soldiers figuring out how to get around uh, that wall of spears. Essentially, a lot of the time they faint one way and then get their shield underneath the spears on them and essentially drive forward almost on their knees but pretty close to it to get up in there and start thrusting at the first line and the moment that they did actually get up to um, these uh, phalangites faces uh, the roman soldier typically uh yeah took them down with pretty brutal efficiency you know the whole point was getting through that wall of spears well that battle that event them all of these guys had uh, more or less figured out, at least a lot better than they had in the prior two battles, and inflicted substantial casualties on Alexander of Pyrrhus' army, um, and actually ended up coining the term Pyrrhic victory, meaning, yeah, Alexander of Pyrrhus technically won the day, but he suffered so many losses that uh, any such uh, additional victory, and he'd be undone. Then you get uh, subsequent two battles in the Macedonian Wars where Rome went with their manipulator system up against the phalanx as again. And essentially the story of those two battles was um, Cynocephaly and then Pydna was nothing went according to plan for either two armies. No one fought on any deal conditions. Everyone essentially, uh, their order of battle was completely messed up and it was essentially who could adapt. Well, each individual soldier uh, for the Romans had been taught, well, you've got to figure things out on your own, uh, like on an individual level as well as each individual cohort. Like, you guys gotta figure this out, stuff out on your own. Us back here, me, commander, I mean, like, I could tell the cavalry to go here or here somewhere, but you guys gotta figure this out. Well, guess what? That ended up proving decisive. These guys, they weren't trained to think like that. These guys were, okay? And so, essentially, at one point, you have uh, a military tribune at the Battle of Sinocephaly, where they've driven one side up like this, and essentially, he takes 2,500 men, smashes into the other part of the Greek phalanx, and the whole thing's over in a matter of minutes. 
Battle of Pydna, hey, uh, yep, yep, the things aren't exactly going our way. You know what we're going to do? We're going to back up on the uneven terrain because we know that's going to work. Uh, we know you guys can't fight very well in that particular fashion. Phalanx follows them. Turns out the Roman soldiers had the right of it uh, and ended up creating a bunch of gaps and ended up smashing the great phalanx. And after the Battle of Pydna, Greece never really returned as a threat to Rome uh, for basically another thousand years or so. All right, so that's generally what's going on here. All right, a sort of example I'm trying to illustrate in terms or metaphor I'm trying to use here. Okay, what's blocked practice versus random practice? Blocked practice is where you practice one particular skill over and over and over and over again, and then switch to another one and practice that over and over and over again. So for example, you could think about, okay, practicing getting off, um, or sorry, wrong arming or denting against the pulling guard as a defensive lineman. So you go practice that one more time, another time, another time, another time. That'd be an example of blocked practice. Random practice is essentially where you're given random assignments. Essentially, things are constantly being changed up. You're not constantly practicing, let's say, to read or palms, uh, whatever you want to call it. No, 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 no. You're going to practice some individual coverage that we're just going to call out randomly. We're going to go this one, then this one, then this one, this one. You don't know whether you have know, one-man surface, two-man surface, three-man surface. It's constantly changing up on you. That's an example of random practice. Now, what they found out over time is that long-term, random practice ends up being better. Short-term, block practice ends up being better in terms of developing skills. Why is that? Well, I sort of illustrated that for you. When you're in random practice, well, each individual, you, you have to sort of figure things out on your own. And over time, that ability to figure things out on your own on the fly is the dominant skill that you need uh, for most forms of sports. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is, whether it be football, basketball, um, figuring things out in that particular situation and then being able to utilize certain muscle memory and uh, sort of cognitive functions to be able to process the information is ultimately what's going to win the day. More technical explanation is the concept of chunking. What's chunking? Chunking is the manner in which your brain sort of chunks different pieces of information together in order to allow you to process it much faster. Now, pretty much everyone watching this is actually performs a particular form of chunking and the form of reading. Most of the time when you read, you don't actually see T-H-E. Your brain automatically chunks it all together, uh, recognizes that one, and just goes the, and you just fly right past. And it gives you the ability, uh, you know, depending on your uh, reading level, to go through sentences in a matter of a second, all because it recognizes these individual chunks. Similar thing uh, with regard to uh, chess grandmasters. Famous study uh, by De Groot. Hey, if we give the uh, flash an image of a real chess position to a chess grandmaster for just a second, well, most of them are able to entirely recreate the whole position from memory. Okay, because they are able to remember all of these individual chunks. Fun fact, if you threw out something that was completely random on a chessboard that it would not have actually come up in a game, chess grandmasters weren't much better than regular people at being able to recreate that position. It's about recognizing those individual little chunks that existed on the chessboard that allowed chess grandmasters to be able to recreate that really, really quickly based on limited sight of what, what they were ultimately looking at. Okay, that's exactly what's happening with random practice. Your brain essentially gets forced to uh, chunk these little pieces of information so that you're able to process it a little bit better. It's not actually occurring on a conscious level. It's actually occurring on a purely subconscious level. And it applies not only to your cognitive functions. Okay, I've seen this type of block before. I've seen this uh, particular uh, route combination before. But also your individual muscle memory. Um, you know, hey, driving my foot uh, off the, my uh, right foot like this here. Those little things end up getting chunked and put into your system. And that's essentially what ha is happening here. It's just uh, on a subconscious level. So if you think of this overall as being your, your conscious skill set, but these individual elements here being the more subconscious ones you're picking up over time, if these ones are essentially being forced to figure things out on the fly constantly, or maybe even the individual cohorts, then you're going to develop that skill set much, much uh, more deeply, more, uh, it's ultimately going to be better over the longer term. But shorter term, this is going to be better. So, as always, hope you found this enjoyable and informative.